Turn it off to Jonathan Corgan. Well, good morning. Welcome back. Uh, I think everyone made it. We haven't heard any uh, calls uh, to bail anyone out, so uh, that might be later in the week. Uh, I think the, the whole uh, decision around doing uh, the conference here in San Diego was uh, so I could avoid jet lag. This is the first time we've, we've done it out on the West Coast. Um, sort of the center of gravity of GNU Radio users uh, is out on the East Coast, and I travel there a lot, so this was a nice, uh, a nice change to continue to see the palm trees while uh, uh, working on GNU Radio stuff. This presentation is <clears throat> really an update to you from us about two things. I want to talk about where we are with the, uh, the famous 3.8 release that you've heard rumors about. Um, I looked at my slides from last GRCon, and I could have probably used half of them. Uh, so I'll talk about what 3.8 is and, and sort of why it's been delayed as long as it has. Uh, and then I want to spend more time on outlining a picture or a vision of what we see GNU Radio evolving into. And you had a bit of it last night on the panel uh, when we talked about heterogeneous computing and um, how GNU Radio can adapt to working in more modern compute platforms uh, than what it was designed for. And so we'll have a, a discussion about that. Uh, and, and the architecture um, that we see um, that can help address that also has a number of side benefits um, that I'll go through. We'll probably end up with end the slides fairly early. Uh, we have 45 minutes for this. That'll leave us a good chunk of time for question and answer. And I'd really like to take the opportunity to, to field as many questions about uh, the, the technical side of the Guinea Radio core software itself uh, and our plans for it, because uh, we don't get a chance to do that very often. Uh, so, so hopefully we can do that. And I, I'm not sure how many mics we would have to, uh, to run around, but we should have uh, some good time for that. When we decided and we forked off the 3.8 release, or the 3.8 development branch, um, the primary thing that was driving it was uh, a transition to Python 3 from Python 2, uh, which uh, on the surface may not sound like a big deal, but we ran into, um, we were already running into major problems at the time. The GNU Radio Companion software uh, was built on originally using uh, a GUI framework, um, PyGTK, which will never see a Python 3 release. And then all of the templating code generation um, used something called Cheetah, which also will never see a Python 3 release. So in order for us to support the Python 3 software uh, base, um, we essentially had to refactor and rewrite GRC uh, to use a different uh, graphics engine and a different code generation engine. So the very long time in coming uh, has been primarily driven by having to do all that work. Uh, on, the, on the surface, it looks like treading water, uh, but in reality, it's been ripping out large parts of GRC, GRC and replacing it. Along the way, um, we decided that the XML form factor for the files that you write when you do an outer tree module to describe your, your blocks to GRC, um, and, the, and the GRC file format itself being based on XML could be greatly improved. And so uh, since we were already doing this um, conversion from Cheetah to something else, the decision was to um, use the uh, Python uh, Mako framework. Uh, and that would give us the ability to use the YAML um, format. So now if you, if, when you look at this, you'll see uh, these files, um, you know, very easy to read, very easy to modify. Uh, and the, <coughs> um, we want to talk later about what to expect. That's one of the things that you're going to have to do um, with your out-of-tree modules is that same kind of conversion. So most of this work is done. It's taken a long time. We've had some attrition in our uh, GRC team, uh, but uh, Sebastian Koslowski, Seth Heifield, um, both um, have spent many hours uh, working on this. We now have um, GRC running on our Python 3 branch um, in either um, Python 2 mode or Python 3 mode. Uh, it can generate flow graphs, uh, and it can um, essentially do what it did before, but now on Python 3. So it's, it's not like it has a whole bunch of new features, uh, but we're not tied to uh, the old Python um, the way we were before. The 
core itself also had to go through some changes, uh, but this is uh, a bit easier. Um, most of our Python supporting GNU Radio is auto-generated code using the SWIG uh, tool chain. So SWIG has supported Python 3 for a long time. But we also have a lot of our own code that we've written in Python inside um, the core software. And of course, we had to go back and uh, manually do that. <coughs> The technique that we're using to support Python 2 and Python 3 simultaneously, uh, we're using the SIX um, compatibility library, if, if any of you are familiar with that. And what that lets us do is have the same code base execute under Python 2 or 3, and the SIX compatibility li library hides the differences between them. And that'll be something that you'll have to look at if you have handwritten uh, Python code in your outer tree modules, is that kind of uh, upgrade process. There is an automated conversion tool for that that does a pretty good job, uh, but there's lots of corner cases that it doesn't cover um, that we have to go back and do that. Um, Doug Anderson from uh, NTIA um, really spent a, a huge amount of time uh, doing this conversion to Python 3. He did the, the CMake updates to, to work with the new dependencies, um, all of the, uh, the SWIG changes, uh, and then the, the porting the QA code going through a large amount of our existing Python. And so we now have it where if you're not using GRC, it is possible to build um, you know, Python scripts that will execute and run GNU Radio um, flow graphs. Uh, there's, there's a few things missing. None of the graphical you know, GUI elements work yet. Uh, but you can write you know, regular flow, gra flow graphs uh, that um, you can you know, run your QA tests on and, and work. So again, this is largely done. Uh, there's a lot of remaining tasks. Uh, but the, the biggest um, obstacles to getting 3.8 done have been these, the, the GRC uh, rewrite for Python 3, uh, and then the update of uh, GNU Radio runtime uh, to use Python 3. As I mentioned, uh, we've had to change the code generator. Uh, and so what we have in GRC is a template system where it combines a flow graph description that's in a .grc XML format file um, and all of the individual block uh, XML files that describe you know, the I.O. ports and the data types and uh, parameters and, and how to create an instance of the block and all of that. And the code generator in Python takes those two things, uses a template, and spits out a Python program. That entire process has changed. And so when you write out of tree modules, um, one of the things that you have to do is to write that um, .xml file that uh, describes your blocks so that they can show up inside GRC and you can use that. Um, mod tool will create new ones, but if you have existing ones, you're gonna have to do that port. And again, there's an automated tool for that. Uh, we ran that and it was something like 80% of our um, block uh, XML files uh, in the block tree were able to be auto-converted. Where we're at right now on that is um, GRC will actually, when it starts up, do that automated process for you. Um, soon we will take those and actually put them into the tree so it doesn't have to do that every time you run it. Um, so if you go to the Python 3 branch and run this, you'll get something that uh, takes some time on startup to do all those uh, conversions. We're gonna do those conversions and then hard code those back into the tree. Um, but this is something that you'll have to pay attention to. Again, you'll also have to um, update any handwritten Python to use uh, the SIX library. Uh, I mean, that really hides a lot of differences between the two platforms. Uh, people have clung to Python 2 for so long uh, that, you know, 2.7. whatever the latest one already has a whole bunch of Python 3-like features. So the difference between them is getting less and less which tells people that they don't need to go to Python 3 yet. Um, how, how many of you use Python 3 uh, for things outside of GNU Radio? Yeah, this will make, uh, make this a lot nicer. On the other hand, not a whole lot has changed on the C++ side. So blocks that you have written in C++ that you know, work functions and, and all of that, uh, we've intentionally avoided making any fundamental changes there uh, so that um, you can focus on the these very deep changes that we're making without having to go rewrite your work functions or, uh, or that sort of thing. So aside from the, the Python code and the, the GRC interface, your existing uh, C++ blocks um, should be relatively unchanged. Uh, one thing is, though, that we're also going through um, 
deprecating a lot of the old and overlapping uh, GR digital blocks. Uh, and some of them will have new replacements. Um, some of them uh, will just be the same block with a different name. And so we'll have a, a porting guide that will say, you know, if you use these blocks, um, then you might have to do something different in 3.8. And most of those blocks have already been marked deprecated. So if you go into GRC and you look at the, um, the block tree, uh, there's a deprecated column that's with this ever-growing number of blocks. Uh, so most of the things that you would have to change, you'll already know about because you'll say, why is my block deprecated? Um, hopefully that'll, that'll help you guys. We're also making a transition from QT4 to QT5. Um, and we're sort of forced to because QT4 is going out of support in so many areas. Um, we have one challenge here. Uh, currently on our next branch, we're supporting both 4 and 5. Uh, but the only reason we're doing that is um, the Ubuntu long-term support uh, 1404 does not have everything for QT5 in it. Uh, this has gone on long enough, though, that we are wondering if it's okay to not support 1404 um, with the QT5. And, and that's something that we have to assess the impact on that. So if uh, we have time for questions, uh, I'd love to hear from somebody that says, I use 1404 and I need QT4 or QT5, and, and please don't uh, deprecate 1404. We have a lot of things left to do before we can make this release. Um, we have the major features implemented, um, but there's a lot of sort of cleanup work that needs to follow. The <coughs> I mentioned the, the block tree um, XML to YAML um, conversion. We're going to be doing that um, you know, in, inside our group soon, because uh, there's, there's an automated way of doing that, and we have one of our uh, um, SOSIS participants uh, working on that. The, the gentleman that's doing the uh, C++ uh, generation in GRC um, is helping out with this. The whole design flow with GR mod tool and PyBombs has not been um, implemented yet to do the, all the Python 3 dependencies and uh, you know, the correct uh, configuration of GNU Radio for that. Um, that should start fairly soon. Uh, I believe PyBombs itself is already Python 3 compatible. Um, Martin might comment on that later. We have some sort of mysterious failures um, in Python 3 of our 220 some uh, sets of QA tests, uh, like 12 of them are failing. Um, and we don't know why yet. Uh, some of it is in interaction with NumPy. There's some uh, assumptions that NumPy is making about uh, vectors uh, and their size that's different from Python 2, and so our code is, is not dealing with it right. So we, we have some, uh, we, we need to put some attention on this. Uh, with people that are more expert than I am uh, on this sort of low-level uh, interface. Of course, we have all of our existing Python examples, all of our existing GRC-based examples. They all need um, updating and testing and, and confirmation that, uh, you know, they all still work. Uh, of course, what little documentation we have needs to be updated as well. That, that's actually going to be a big issue because there's a lot that's going to look different. Uh, and if you have um, code you've written that used 3.7, uh, the steps that you have to take to make it work with 3.8, they're not um, terrible, but they're not always obvious. And so we're going to have to make that porting guide. And unfortunately, um, my guess right now is that the Python 3 branch is probably run on less than 20 computers. Most of those are the developers, and the rest of it is our uh, um, CI system. And so we need to have this exposed to a lot more um, versions of operating systems, um, running uh, flow graphs that are uh, different from, for example, the ones that we have in the QA tests. We're looking for people that are willing to uh, not even fix bugs, but just run this and find out where it breaks and let us know so that we can focus on getting these things fixed. Our current uh, plan, uh, if you're not familiar with how we do our, uh, our releases from the, the Git repo, is we have normally three branches. We have our maintenance branch where we post bug fixes. We have our master branch where we put in new API features. Uh, and then we have our next branch uh, where we break everything, and that's where 3.8 is being done. The Python 3 code has been so invasive that um, we've had to uh, do that separately on a Python 3 branch. 
now that we've got everything on the Python 3 branch uh, using all of the new dependencies uh, instead of the old ones, our next step is to merge that back into Next. Um, so that now we have, we're back to our um, you know, maintenance 3.7 and next branch for 3.8. The downside to that is 3.8 has been so long in coming, there's a lot of people using the next branch in production. Um, and so if we do that, all of a sudden we're gonna break a bunch of stuff. And we'd like to hear if that's a concern. If you're using the next branch um, in a situation where you uh, that would be a problem for you. And then we need to hear about it. Because we always promise next is the, you know, the Wild West. Uh, if it breaks, you keep both pieces and all that. Um, but we recognize that we've been so long in, in getting this out that people have been using the, the repo bef you know, prior to that. Um, and so I don't want to get in a situation where we do something without being able to communicate, hey, this is about to happen. So during, during the questions, let me know if that's the case. All right. What I want to talk about now is, uh, as I mentioned, um, a picture of what um, we see could happen with Guinea Radio. Uh, one of the things with um, open source projects, again, uh, almost everything that is in the Guinea Radio tree is volunteer driven. Um, we've had some funded work, uh, but most of what we see, we see and you use are contributions from users um, that haven't been paid for their work. Uh, they have different uh, motivations. So we end up uh, trying to paint a picture of what things should look like and hopefully people say, yeah, that's a great idea, let me go do that. Uh, and that's very different from the commercial world. So when I, when I just describe this, um, what I'm describing is not a, um, uh, a hard and fast plan. It's here's how we think the new radio needs to go to address some of the problems that it has. It was born in the early 2000s, um, single core, um, single threaded application even. And so uh, you had processors uh, that, you know, one thread of execution, all of your blocks, you know, the scheduler went around robin between them. Uh, as dual core and multi-core came out, then we bolted on a um, thread per block, uh, which allows it to scale up much better. The original architecture of GNU Radio was a data-driven um, flow model where you had, you know, the, the, the CS term, communicating sequential processes, goes back to the 70s. It's not anything that we invented. Uh, but it makes it very um, easy to compose independent um, signal processing functions by having them run uh, independently with no shared state, and then they connect to each other um, through very well-defined interfaces. And in our case, and in the original case with GNU Radio, that was the uh, you know, continuous streaming model. And, and that sort of remained um, the center of gravity for GNU Radio for a long time. Um, we have bolted onto that over the years since then, the multi-threaded execution, the uh, addition of being able to pass around um, asynchronous messages built out of polymorphic types, uh, which is a great way to, to deal with uh, metadata. Those same polymorphic types um, added as metadata to streams. Actually, the stream tags came first. Um, we have something that, uh, is going to go away, uh, the tag stream blocks. Um, if you have any questions on how those work, you can ask Tim O'Shea. But uh, the, the tag stream block was something that we did out of necessity because we didn't have uh, the message crowds passing way of doing things. Um, it's turned out to be uh, problematic to use, to implement. It's going away. Um, we don't have replacements yet for um, what we have implemented as TSBs. The whole GRC environment was something that was bolted on uh, by um, Josh Bloom um, as part of his um, uh, thesis. And that has become you know, the, the way that almost everyone onboards onto GNU Radio. But as I mentioned, um, you know, a lot of it is uh, not bit rotting, but it's based on dependencies that are going away. And so this has become uh, a big issue for us. A couple years ago, uh, we also had uh, ZMQ. Uh, which is a, uh, a nice transport uh, for data over um, several different types of transport. Uh, it was originally implemented by um, Johanna Schmitz uh, in uh, Austria. I can't remember his academic affiliation. Uh, but it's become uh, very popular as a way of getting streaming data and messaging data in and out of Guinea Radio flow graphs. And uh, apparently a way to uh, 
avoid the GPL as well. Um, so th this whole thing started uh, with the GNU Radio um, uh, 2.8 release in 2002, uh, and then all these things have been added to it. And it's worked surprisingly well. I mean, for all of the sort of warts, and uh, I can tell that this has sort of grown organically, um, just based on the sheer amount of work that people are doing with GNU Radio, this architecture has lasted you know, 14 years. Um, and it hasn't undergone huge changes. It's had bug fixes, it's had new features, uh, you know, like I said. Uh, but for the kinds of problems that we have been solving, the existing GNU Radio architecture has served us well. What's missing is the view of the world of how modern applications work. The Instead of running an application on your PC with a single core uh, and a GUI on your screen, the way you did things back in 2002, now, um, especially for larger systems, you have a mix of general purpose processors, often in a NUMA configuration where you've got to deal with uh, differences in performance and memory access and all of that. Uh, you have coprocessors doing um, fundamentally different architecture type uh, processing, GPUs and FPGAs. You have specialized DSP chips um, that you can access, and they're all connected through a variety of interconnects, whether it be a memory bus, it, uh, a network bus, um, PCI, um, a interface to a sea of gates inside of a, an FPGA. A GNU Radio application did not play well here without a lot of hand-holding. We've been able to do this manually. We've been able to you know, throw a ZMQ block on the end so that I can go connect over the network to another flow graph running. Or I can um, implement my own uh, GPU offload and communications data path down to uh, a GPU and back uh, to be able to take advantage of that. But that doesn't scale at all. Everyone has to start from scratch, and they all do it differently. Um, they have to resolve the same bugs each time, and nobody can take advantage of anyone else's work. Uh, so we've had to take a fresh look at sort of how Guinea Radio uh, conceptualizes what it's doing and how we could abstract that in a way that um, is sort of uniform across all those domains. And our, um, th there's a surprisingly small footprint that a Guinea Radio application has. Uh, if you look at it just from a uh, outsider's point of view, there are bulk flows of data, which is what we started with. We have message-based data, where you have a, a set of messages um, that encapsulate some amount of uh, data and, and properties we call a PDU. And then we have out-of-band data for setting configuration parameters for monitoring um, statistics and monitoring um, when things happen. And then there's the user interface, of course, that has to sit on top of this. So we, we've looked at this and figured that if we could find a way to uh, abstract these, then we can allow not only GNU Radio to um, span across you know, multiple processors in NUMA and, and multiple processes on, a, uh, I'm sorry, on the same machine, multiple applications uh, over a network, um, or communicating with uh, other GNU Radio instances uh, over a bus, but um, it also would make it much easier to interface with outside systems uh, in this you know, complex, uh, heterogeneous network of, of computing. What we've come up with so far is the idea that we can take these uh, streams, either, either bulk flow streams or message streams, uh, and turn those into named endpoints. And instead of, uh, you know, like when you call tb.connect and you connect your blocks, instead of using instances of blocks to connect, you would use their names. And then the runtime would figure out, oh, that that's a block in my same flow graph. I'll just use the same uh, you know, double buffered uh, mechanism that I have now. Oh, that block lives on you know, the other end of the internet. Uh, I'll set up a ZMQ tunnel to, to connect to that. The idea is that for um, the flows, All right, you won. Um, 
the idea is that we should be able to think of these flows of data uh, you know, the same way you'd think about network pipes or you'd think about distributing computing. Now, uh, before anyone asks me if uh, we're going to integrate CORBA, uh, <laughs> how many veterans of CORBA do we have here? Yeah. yeah. The, the idea is not to do that. The idea is that um, we can abstract things in a way that's very lightweight, um, that doesn't require a central you know, broker or you know, any kind of uh, infrastructure to support it, um, and that is just as easy to connect these abstractions, flows, um, and uh, well, I'll get to properties in a second, uh, to outside applications written in different languages that have nothing to do with GNU Radio. And I'll, I'll talk in the, on the last slide about how that might happen. The other thing that we have a challenge with is um, how to configure out of band the operation of signal processing units um, either at startup or ongoing at runtime. And the mechanism we have now, like in GRC, is that when you define a, a, a variable and an element, the template engine just turns that into variables and function calls. And of course, function calls are not thread safe. Um, if you wanted to do it the proper way, you have to go implement a mutex and then acquire it in the work function, and there's all this extra work you have to do. The idea here is um, to implement something that's completely thread safe, uh, where the uh, block that is setting a property on another block is doing it by name, and it's the runtime that is responsible for routing that to the appropriate destination, and then calling a function um, uh, or whatever the mechanism is inside that block's own thread context. It's, it's a wart we've had since the very beginning, and we've gotten away with it far longer than I expected. Um, but the way to solve this is to turn um, that configuration interface into something formal as well. And we, we have lots and lots and lots of experience in distributed computing, uh, you know, in the, in the web world with microservices and the idea of a, of a REST-like interface, um, defining configuration on blocks as things that you can set and get. Um, and you don't worry about how it actually happens. You just do that on the well-known endpoint. Um, and, the, and the runtime figures out how to make that happen. Um, that'll be key to scaling up um, these kinds of applications uh, to large systems. When we have to interface right now with other frameworks, um, it's a very painful process of, okay, this framework thinks about these things, this framework thinks about these things, and I gotta write some sort of gasket that matches those. And we're hoping by making these interfaces more formal than, um, outside systems can communicate with GNU Radio in a much simpler fashion, because they're not reverse engineering our wire format for messages. Um, you know, the behavior um, of the interface is well-defined, and sort of all the things you need to do to write robust code to interface between systems. We're calling this the client-server model. I don't know if that name's gonna survive, because it sort of implies a hierarchy, uh, and this is more like a peer-to-peer -peer kind of thing. Um, you know, where you just have a, a, a set of units communicating with each other as needed without any kind of, without any kind of central uh, broker or service that is uh, administering those messages. But the idea, again, is that um, blocks don't need to worry about whether their interfaces to the world, configuration, um, bulk flows of uh, streaming data, and bulk flows of messages, uh, it doesn't care about where those go, who's connected to them. It could be on another machine, it could be on another process, it could be on the other side of the network, um, it could be over a bus to an FPGA. Um, the block doesn't worry about that. It has a name and it has a property and it can set it or, or get it. Um, and the uh, distributed architecture then just really becomes, you know, it just sort of falls out naturally. This is not anything new. I mean, we were doing this in the 90s um, with Unix systems and you know, DCE and all of that. So there's, there's a whole lot of prior experience in how to implement distributed systems that we can draw from. Uh, we're not inventing anything here. Uh, you know, if anything, we're you know, just getting with the party. Um, but I'm hoping that this is the key to allowing us to scale much faster and higher than we've been um, with just writing single process GNU radio apps with the GUI running on the same machine. I'm pretty convinced that we're never gonna be in a position 
where GNU Radio is generating anything other than GNU Radio code running in C or Python on a GPP. Uh, I, you know, the idea of you know, like a HLS type uh, compiler or having an abstract uh, notation of a, of a signal flow and then that gets turned into GPO, GPU code or whatever, I, I think that's a science project and sort of a wish list that'll never happen. Um, well, if it, if, if it were to happen, it would require lots of dollars and may not end up where we would want it. Um, so I think if we look at the experience we've had with RFNOC, you know, where the idea is there are things that are happening outside of GNU Radio, but they have some kind of proxy representation inside GNU Radio. Uh, if any of you have worked with that, you know, the RFNOC blocks, they look like, you know, they're on the screen in GRC, but they're not, um, you know, of course, they're not executed on the machine. So I want to go back over our experience with that uh, and with people who have used RFNOC um, and have had to build their own uh, interfaces to RFNOC modules to interface inside GNU Radio. Uh, and see where the warts are and see where that was hard or, or what learnings we can make from that. Because RFNOC is sort of the closest we've had to this kind of distributed architecture, even though it's limited to a, a single vendor um, and, and a FPGA, of course. Another challenge we face is that GNU Radio really does not have a lot of support for interacting um, with users that aren't in sitting in front of a screen where the flow graph is running. You know, when you play around in GRC and you mock up a, a simple GUI, um, it ends up generating, you know, a GUI inside the same process as the flow graph. And if you actually want to have that interface running on another machine, uh, it, it can't do that. Uh, and we, we've got some sort of really ad hoc ways of sending messages uh, over ZMQ that allow you to uh, um, do updates and whatnot. But we're looking at, um, this same client server uh, named endpoint REST-like interface um, to allow the GUI to simply send updates to that endpoint for configuration and to query those endpoints for display. And that could be on the same machine, it could be on a remote machine. The underlying transport, again, since it's all abstracted out, um, would literally not make a difference uh, other than latency times uh, between those things. Um, Again, this is not anything new. Uh, X Windows has been around longer than my son. Uh, you know, so the idea of uh, a protocol for um, display and for um, configuration over a network or over a transport is not anything that we're going to invent. Um, there's lots of examples to draw from uh, for how to do that. A particular use case I think will be important to a lot of people is with embedded systems. If you've got a, a single board computer with no display, it's headless, uh, and it's running a GNU radio application, um, you're either going to run a GUI on there and, and look at it through uh, an X session, um, or you're going to try to come up with some way of running a UI remotely and have it poke at the, uh, the device over the network or whatever. If we go this route with, the, with this client server architecture, it will be a natural function to uh, implement a flow graph on an embedded system and have a display elsewhere running on a high speed system so you can have the, you know, the normal user experience uh, without having to go through contortions on, on how they should communicate. Uh, so, I mean like an, an E310 for example, you know, uh, it has that challenge now and a lot of people are using uh, embedded systems for um, you know, small form factor and, and power requirements, but GNU Radio has not made that an easy uh, process. Another thing that um, we're looking at is the current design of GRC is a program generator. You go in, you configure your blocks, you set up your parameters, you connect things together, um, you make them, um, uh, you make them do what you want, and then you hit play, and it creates a Python flow graph and runs it. If you want to make changes, you stop your application, you go back, make changes. Um, update parameters, test things, and then I click play and it, and it runs again. So GRC is not a runtime environment. Again, because you can abstract these flows and uh, property updates, it would be possible, if we want to go this route, to have GRC migrate to an online system where, you know, kind of like GDB attaching to a process, 
having GRC attached to a flow graph and be able to manipulate it in real time. So instead of adding a block and restarting it, you're actually at a block while it's running and be able to see real-time feedback on the system. You know, flow graph reconfiguration, um, statistics, um, sort of ad hoc probing. These are all things that um, would be possible if GRC could simply talk to these abstract notions of flows uh, and blocks rather than um, being just a program generator. If we had this interface, it would also mean that you could script these things. Instead of running it from inside GRC, you could actually define a flow graph in some format and then run a script that, says, that stands that up and, and creates it on the fly. Because it would just be using the same back end um, uh, that the, uh, the GRC tool would. So time check, I have about 15 minutes. Thank you. So the, the way we think about doing this um, is to take advantage of what a lot of people have already figured out. Um, the, the ZMQ messaging system, uh, it's, it's ironic because Z stands for zero message, um, has become very uh, popular because it's so lightweight. It's a thin layer above TCP uh, and now UDP, uh, which I haven't uh, experimented with yet, um, or over Unix sockets or even you know, over shared memory inside the same process. It adds um, some message passing semantics um, that allow you to define a topology like a pub sub type interface or a push pull or there's a dozen different topologies that, that ZMQ can do. And now it also has the ability to do uh, bulk encryption and asymmetric uh, authentication. So you can actually set up these flows over an untrusted network and use the um, cryptography to uh, uh, achieve you know, certain guarantees. My expectation uh, is that this can be the backbone of sort of all of this, and that what rides over that um, and, the, and the configuration of that would be the responsibility of the runtime. The user is simply thinking in terms of endpoints and, uh, and properties. So when I do a, a, a connect of two blocks, um, that block might be on another machine, and I just have a connection uh, on the screen, but the runtime figures out, hey, these two guys are you know, different IP networks, and I'll stand up a, a ZMQ tunnel to do that. Or, um, oh no, these blocks are in the same process and the same flow graph. I'll just use the traditional connection that we have now. The, uh, the mechanism that we have now for doing streaming flow between blocks using these double buffered messages, or uh, double, uh, double mapped uh, buffers, is uh, very high performance. Uh, we haven't been able to improve on it. Uh, and I don't see ZMQ replacing that for stuff running in the same process inside an application like it does now. Uh, what this doesn't solve is how do we talk to, in a sort of standardized way, you know, kernels running uh, on a GPU, um, CEs running inside a, an FPGA. Uh, there are mechanisms for doing that in a vendor-specific and in a um, uh, application-specific way. Of this whole vision, this is sort of the more nebulous. Um, we're looking at a, at a variety of things. I think there's going to be a presentation later on on OpenCI and how it solves these problems. Uh, OpenCPI, rather. Um, this is an area where we can really use the help of some domain experts that have experience in working with this kind of thing to figure out what's the right way to abstract this um, so that every time I want to talk to a different DSP application, I'm not writing from scratch how I'm going to talk to that uh, on a GPU for example. Um, so that's sort of an open hole is we can distribute, GNU, we can distribute GNU radio on GPPs quite well with this design, but it doesn't address um, what do foreign uh, systems look like to GNU radio? How can I um, talk to uh, a FIFO interface on an FPGA and deliver it a stream of samples? Or how can I uh, go over a you know, DMA bus to a DSP a DSP chip uh, and, and feed it data or set its configuration and that sort of thing. ZMQ is a transport. It doesn't solve, um, it doesn't say what you have to send over it. So another part of this design is to come up with a way to serialize all of this that can be marshaled onto the wire and unmarshaled uh, on the other end. 
Um, there's a lot of different ways of doing this, and there's a, there's a lot of different um, serialization protocols. A very popular one to run over ZMQ is the Google Protobufs. Um, there's a lot of experience with that, I'm sure here in the room as well. Um, you know, I'm in favor of if other people have solved the problem, we'll use that. Uh, and I don't want to invent anything new here if I don't have to. So protobufs over ZMQ is a popular thing to look at first. Um, I don't know um, if that's the way things will end up. I think so. Um, but of course, there are a lot of people here using GNI Radio that have experience in these kind of systems, and I'd love to hear from you um, on what you think the challenges are of uh, you know, serialization and this kind of thing. One benefit that um, you get from these kind of systems is the marshalling and unmarshalling code exists in like a dozen different libraries or uh, languages. So if you need to connect to something written in JavaScript, if you need to connect to something written in Python, if you need to connect to something written in C Sharp, um, you now can, without having to manually write all of the um, interfaces to get into GNU Radio, configuration, bulk flows, and message flows. I will leave this uh, on the note that uh, this is not a, uh, a program or a project plan. It's not a, road or a release plan. Uh, it is a roadmap. It's something that we've come up with as a way of addressing what we think some of the very distinct challenges GNU Radio faces scaling to modern uh, compute platforms uh, from its origins as a, as a single core, single threaded uh, application. We can't say, okay, I'm gonna go hire you know, 50 developers uh, and pay them to go implement this uh, product <coughs> specification. We can try to say, this is what we think is a great idea uh, and look at all the problems you could solve and hope that developers will um, respond to that uh, and you know, sort of self-organize into a, a project that, that can get this done. However, our experience in the last year and a half has sort of told us otherwise. Um, features like this need to be designed up front. They can't be accreted over time. And the only way to do that is to have dedicated sort of full-time people working on uh, fleshing out the major part of this and getting to the point where then you can divvy up uh, development um, in parallel with small chunks at a time and then people can come and go and some people can you know, get interest and lose interest, uh, but there's a certain amount of work up front that it would take to convert this idea uh, into an implementation before then you know, people can just show up out of nowhere and say, hey, I implemented these 10 things for you. Um, you know, that really can't happen until you know, we have this, this core infrastructure in place. Uh, like Ben said uh, yesterday in the project update, you know, we are looking at um, actively seeking you know, sponsored funds uh, for doing directed development. Uh, I think the volunteer-driven approach has gotten us uh, a great ways. The existing runtime and implementation in, in Guinea Radio has um, uh, carried us a very long way. But this sort of rewrite and, and scaling of how Guinea Radio works internally uh, is going to require um, something beyond, I think, the organizational capacity of uh, volunteers coming forward and saying, yeah, I'll, I'll write something. With that, I'll open it up to questions. I think we have about 10 minutes. We do. Thank you, Jonathan. All right, do we have any questions from the audience? My job is done. Oh, we got one from Joe. Oh. Okay, so uh, first of all, thanks for going to YAML. Uh, I'm a Ruby programmer, and I love YAML. It saved my neck a number of times. Um, when you were talking about um, being able to control uh, a GNU radio load from a remote GUI, uh, so a lot of times you just want to change a parameter, and uh, the uh, uh, so you may want to might want to patch a block in or out or something like that. So my question has to do with uh, have you kind of thought through uh, whether you could really have a, a multi relationship different um, configured GNU radio instances and other GUI instances so that they could all talk to each other in a, in a flat kind of way, or whether you actually have to have a server equivalent function at the, at the GNU radio. And uh, the question has to do with what level of capability, tweak a parameter, watch the 
results yeah. change, add a block, what, look at a different part, and that kind of question. So there you go, Jonathan. Thank you. Very good question. Uh, my experience on working on systems like this a long time ago, um, and, and what I expect to see if we go this route, is that there will be some kind of hierarchy that will natural, naturally follow the container relationship of hierarchical blocks. And so you know, the, the runtime uh, equivalence on, on two ends of the endpoint would be responsible for propagating things down through things that they own. Um, but that, um, by far and large, it would be a peer-to-peer -peer mesh of things rather than you know, a strict, uh, you know, this, this thing is where everything goes and then it routes to these blocks and then lower and lower. Um, I'm a big fan of um, letting the developer say do this rather than having to go figure out, okay, there's this whole, you know, write all this IDL uh, uh, and talk to a broker and, and do all that. If, if two blocks can talk to each other um, by just their endpoints, um, then nothing else needs to get involved. And, and, and when I say two blocks, a, a GUI element that is setting that parameter like you described would be in the same situation where you, you change the uh, parameter and it sends a message over the transport and the block responds to it. Um, and there's no, nobody else needs to care. Does, it, does that answer? Okay, good. Okay, any other questions from the audience? I'll be, I'll be in the here. back to, to sign up volunteers. Hi, I'm Kirby Cartwright from uh, Simple Executive, and we've done ah, some yes. work with a scheduler, and uh, so I've, you kind of lightly alluded to it, and I think it's gotten kind of creaky, especially with use to multiple, multiple cores. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about that? Well, again, the, the original genesis of the runtime design in GNU Radio was in the single core world. Uh, and it still shows. Um, it's possible to um, now implement multiple threads with a thread per block, but we're entirely relying on either the operating system to schedule threads among CPUs, uh, and we're also relying on you know, the designer understanding enough about the NUMA system to be able to set thread priorities, to judge, you know, do I manually place these two blocks um, on these cores because they share an L2 and not main memory? You know, that kind of thinking, um, a lot of that can be automated, um, as you know. Um, and uh, looking forward to your presentation. But um, none of that intelligence is in GNU Radio right now. And I don't know what form that takes, uh, but if you have built a high-end GNU Radio flow graph on a you know, 64 core uh, machine um, that has to talk to multiple machines, you're, you're in this manual configuration nightmare. Uh, and there's really no tools that exist to analyze that situation and say, here's the best way to do that. It's kind of a lead in. Um, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll talk more, I'm sure. All right, any other questions from the audience? Oh, right here. So do you envision the uh, protobufs fully replacing the PMTs that we have in GNU Radio right now? Was that your idea about introducing That's a, that? That's a, so the question um, is, uh, we have this current set of uh, polymorphic types that we use to transport data around, and would the protobus replace that? It's an open question. I don't know if that's the best way to go. Um, the idea of the PMTs um, is very useful. Uh, so it could be, you know, PMTs are how it exists inside the flow graph, and then they get marshaled into protobufs for transport, and then unmarshaled back into PMTs. Um, it's certainly possible to completely replace the PMT uh, library with um, the protobufs, but then that would mean that there's a lot more in GNU Radio that would have to be changed out, because the, the PMT concept is built into everything. Uh, so it would be hard to do, but if it were the right thing, then we would. It's an open question on whether it's the right thing. Yeah. That's a good question. Any others? Oh, over here, Josh. Uh-oh. Uh, hello. Uh, first off, apologies about the uh, Python choices I made a long time ago. It looks like that <laughs> gave you a lot of help. Um, one of the things I, I do is I parse nearly all of your GRC XML files because I'm interested in object introspection is what's the constructor, what's its name, what's its parameters, how can I find out about which calls to settings, which calls to get. Yep. Uh, so the first question is, okay, we're doing YAML. 
have we made any structural changes instead of sort of a templated blog we make? Are there, is there a more structured way to find that information from the YAML? And uh, I guess I'll go on and say, it looks like a lot of the things you described much later on the presentation, we really need as a backbone some kind of object introspection in GNU Radio where blocks themselves can register and say, what's my constructor, what's my settings, et cetera. Yeah. And a lot of that falls in place after that. So I'm kind of curious what you thought about the YAML structuring or maybe something even more structural from an API perspective with the introspection. Sure. The, the use of the YAML um, in the GRC um, files we were sort of backed into having to do something that we could actually finish uh, in enough time. Uh, and even that has been a, uh, a long process. So we did not go through what would be the best way to change these to get the kind of functionality you're asking about. So the YAML format is not adding anything new um, other than a easier to parse and easier to read uh, and easier to humanly modify. I'm still happy about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but part of this um, REST-like abstraction would be the ability to enumerate um, things on the other end. You know, I made the analogy of uh, GRC operating like GDB for a flow graph, attaching to a flow graph, enumerating the blocks, enumerating their properties, and all of that, and getting a picture of what's running on that other system. Um, that kind of thing is natural, you know, enumeration of, of things. Um, that's a natural fit for um, what you're asking for. So we will have to figure out how to implement that what we're doing for 3.8 has nothing like that for you. All right, we have just a minute left. Any quick questions left? Nope, all right, thank you, Jonathan. Awesome, thank you. Can we give it to them? Or? No, no, leave it here. Got it.